Okay, so good afternoon to you all. Thanks for coming to this key paper session. Uh, today, Danny is going to be doing a presentation on quantum simulation. And so first, I'm just going to show you a bit about the people that are behind this research topic. And then Danny is going to explain in depth his paper. So the idea of a quantum simulation with trapped ions came from a paper of these two guys on the top who are Diego Porras and Ignacio Dirac, and they work in the Max Planck Institute uh, for Quantum Optics. And uh, what the paper he's going to present today is done in this research group in uh, Freiburg University, is the research group of this guy, but specifically he's going to uh, delve more into the work of uh, this one, who is Axel Kirchnauer. Uh, he was a PhD student on the time, and uh, he has gotten like most of the information from his PhD thesis. And uh, a bit of curiosity of these these two guys, who are the main authors of the paper he's going to present, are now working in the industry in these uh, two companies, which are photonics companies. So, you might see. Danny, uh, you can start. Thank you very much, Alvaro. Uh, okay. So, hi everybody. I'm Danny, and. In this talk, I want to give a little bit of an overview of the main concepts of analog quantum simulation. Uh, specifically, I want to focus on a, on a simulation that was carried out like around 2010 by, and, well, and it was about simulating a quantum spin system of two spins. And this is what this paper is about. But first, to give a feeling of what analog quantum simulation is, let me tell you something. Okay, so as you may know, uh, the design and manufacture process of an airplane is very long. So this is for many reasons, but one of them is that each different part of an airplane and the airplane itself needs to be carefully studied before they make their way into the air with real passengers. Now, during the design process, one of the first steps is to take a computer, take some simulation software, and simulate how the wind will blow around the airplane, how the structure of the airplane will hold. But once we have, uh, once we have satisfactory simulations, what we have to do is verify these simulations physically. And so what you use is wind tunnels. Okay, so in wind tunnels, what you do is get one part of the airplane or a smaller version of the airplane into the tunnel and fix them in a stationary position and then some very big fans and very powerful will blow air through the tunnel and by putting a smoke in the air you can see how the air is moving around the object you can also play some detectors to see what force is being exerted on the airplane uh, you can also tilt the object to, see, uh, to study how different directions of the wind affect uh, the airplane. So the point is that we have created a different system that the one, than the one that we want to study, which would be the airplane flying in the air, but it is a system that behaves equivalently to that uh, uh, system of study. And also, most importantly, we can manipulate and control this uh, system specifically to study the things that we want. And also, it is uh, nice to notice that in computer simulations, uh, well, they are way cheaper than wind tunnels, but the wind tunnels have an advantage, which in this case may not be so apparent, but you don't need a computer to carry out all the difficult mathematical computations. And so, this uh, quantum analog uh, sorry, analog quantum simulations are a concept similar to this in the sense that you take a quantum system and that you create a different one but which behaves equivalently and then if you can manipulate and control it specifically the way you want, you can study it in depth. Now, uh, so one of the advantages of quantum simulation is that if you have a quantum system and it it gets very large, like on the order of 50 particles or so, and you have many particles and many interactions, uh, computer simulations take very long to, to finish. But quantum simulations, since they, since they uh, take advantage of nature, 
nature carries out the simulations. And so, in principle, they are way faster than computer simulations. And this is like the commercial aspect that is interesting. Okay, so now that we know a little bit what uh, analog quantum simulation is, let's look at some specific cases. So, an important model to study, uh, for example, uh, phase transitions is the icing model. In this case, we have here the one-dimensional icing model, uh, which basically describes a chain of particles uh, with some spin, plus or minus one. And the Hamiltonian is this one. Basically, what you have is an interaction between neighboring spins, between this spin and this spin, and this spin and this spin. And what this term, which is the spin-spin interaction, what it tells you is that uh, spins, when they are po uh, pointing in the same direction, so either up, up, and down, down, this is energetically more favorable than having the, the spins point in opposite directions, so up, down, and down. Um, and this second other thing here is uh, the interaction between the spin and the external magnetic field. And so what it means physically is that the spin tends to align itself with the magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field is pointing upwards. Now the thing is that this so-called spin is not quantum. Like in quantum mechanics, a spin is an operator. And it's not a quantity that simply takes the values plus or minus one. So what to, to study quantum phase transitions, what we use is the Heisenberg model which is very similar to the icing model, but we have just simply put some hats here to represent operators. <laughs> and, and yeah, that's it. So the only, the only thing to, to emphasize here is that we have a spin one half particles, so the spin is still described by an up and a down state, but also a superposition of this up and down state. Okay. So in the paper, they simplify the, the problem and they focus on a two uh, spin system uh, in one dimension. And they also simplify the, the picture to have only spin-spin uh, in interactions in the set axis and the magnetic field is in the x axis, okay? So now the question is, how do we simulate this, so how do we build an equivalent system to represent this Hamiltonian, this one? Okay, so I have written here like three or four requirements that this equivalent system needs to satisfy to simulate this Hamiltonian. First one, you need to have an object that has two levels, okay? That has two levels and that can be in a superposition of these two levels, so this object has to be quantum in nature. Uh, now, in our case, this object will be an ion, which will be fixed in some position. And now, if you take another ion, you will have a, a one ion with two levels and the other one with two levels, so you will have your two spins that you need for the, for the system. Um, now, the third thing, the third requirement, is to be able to replicate somehow this interaction between the spin and the magnetic field. And the final requirement is to simulate, of course, the spin-spin interaction. Okay, so how do we build a two-level system? Okay, so what they did in the paper is take a look at magnesium. Magnesium has two electrons in the S orbital. And so what they did is ionize it, and so they only have one electron. And now, if you look at the energy levels of magnesium, you have this. Uh, this is the ground state of the ionized magnesium. This is the first excited state. But well, you know that this picture is very simple. It's not taking into account many things. So we have to take into account all the interactions that are happening. One of them is the fine structure. Fine structure is the spin orbit coupling of the electron in the ion, and also some other relativistic effects. Fine structure doesn't split the ground state, but it does split the first excited state. And finally, we also have to consider the hyperfine structure, which is a coupling between the spin of the nucleus and the total angular momentum of the electron. Now, hyperfine structure splits our ground state, 
and this will be our two-level system. Okay, so because we have one, only one electron, this electron will be in these two levels, and it can be in the up state, in the down state, or in a superposition of the two. So now you take this uh, ionized magnesium, uh, you take another one, and you have your two spin. Okay. So we have already accomplished two of our requirements that we needed. Let's go to let's see how we simulate the magnetic interaction with the spins. So first, what we need to do is like what in in what is the effect of a magnetic field on a spin? What is the real effect to be able to simulate? So imagine that you have a single particle, a single spin of a spin one half, and you apply a magnetic field in the x direction. The Hamiltonian is this one. This this Hamiltonian is the one that you already saw here. Okay. Um, and now imagine that you have your spin in this initial state, in the up state, okay? And you apply the magnetic field. What will happen is that the up state, so if this is a magnetic field and this is the up state, the up state will start to rotate around the magnetic field, okay? Uh, so you will start in this up state and it will go after some time to the down state and then it will go back up after some equal time to the up state. So the, the spin is oscillating between, between these two states and at any given, any given point in time, the wave function describing the state is this one. So it is, in general, it is a superposition of the up and down states. So how, we, how do we translate this picture to our ion, you know, the electron in the, in the two levels? Okay, so we have our ionized magnesium. Uh, the electron is somewhere here, either in the up state, in the down state, or in a superposition of the two. You have this separation energy, which is delta E, and it can also be written uh, in terms of H bar multiplied by omega sub zero. And in the case of the magnesium ion, this frequency is 1.79 gigahertz. What this means is that if you have the electron in the up state, and it transitions to the down state, it will emit a, a photon of 1.79 gigahertz. Okay? Now, how do we obtain this oscillatory behavior of the electron to oscillate between these two states? Well, we send a radio frequency pulse. So, this radio frequency pulse can be modeled as this electric field. Uh, you have uh, that it is sinusoidal, it has angular frequency omega, this amplitude epsilon sub zero, and some polarization given by this vector. And so the additional interaction that the electron suffers because of this uh, electric field is the one written here. You are probably already familiar with this term because here you have the charge of the electron and here it's position, so this is the electric dipole moment of the electron, and this is the electric field. So the multiplication of the two gives the energy. Now, I'm not going to give the mathematical motivation for this, but if you're interested, you can follow it easily in any quantum optics uh, textbook. But what happens is that with this Hamiltonian, the electron will start to oscillate between the up and down states. And the, its state is going to be described by this wave function, okay? And this oscillation frequency, which is determined by omega sub r, is proportional to the amplitude of the electric field that we are applying. So it's not dependent on any other control parameter, not on omega, not on omega zero, just this amplitude of the electric field the oscillation of the electron, okay? So, this is very nice, that the fact that we control, the, that we can control the oscillation frequency of the electron with our electric field amplitude is nice because if you notice, this state, this oscillation state, is very similar to the one that we wanted to simulate. The only difference is that this gamma V sub X has to be replaced by omega sub R. So, since the oscillation frequency can be measured experimentally if you equate these two quantities 
and by since you know omega sub r and gamma is a known constant, you know which magnetic field you are simulating, okay, with a certain electric uh, field. So this is very nice because here you see clearly the connection between the picture of the, the, the system that you want to simulate and your the system that you have created. And so we now know how to simulate the magnetic field and spin spin interaction. We only have the spin spin interaction left. Uh, but as a quick reminder, let me what well, let me remind you that in the Hamiltonian, this term here, which is the spin spin interaction, what it meant is that the spins are more prone to pointing in the same direction than in opposite directions. Okay? So what does this mean in our ion picture? What it means is that having both electrons of the, of the two ions in the same state, so in the up and up state or down and down state, is more like energetically more favorable than having them in different states. Okay? This is what it means. And now, how do we make how do we make these two ions interact right because we need somehow like a spin spin interaction um, so okay the ion is fixed well not fixed but it is in, a, in a, an equilibrium position because it is suffering like a harmonic potential and so it is usually in this position and now imagine that you apply a constant force to this ion what will happen is that the equilibrium position will display, uh, sorry, displace. And now imagine that this uh, force that we are applying is not constant, but it is harmonic. So the electron, instead of going, so, sorry, before you had that the, elect the ion would move to this new equilibrium position, and if the force is harmonic, the ion will start to oscillate. Okay, so if you have the two ions and you apply the same force, uh, the same harmonic force to the both of them, they will start to oscillate in this way, like in phase. Now, what if the direction of the force depended on the state of the electron? So imagine if, if the force so if you have the electrons in the same level, the, the, direction, the direction of the force in this is in the same direction, and they move like this. But if one of the electrons is in, in the up state and the other one in the down state, then the forces are opposite, and the ions will start to move like this. And so what this means is that because of this uh, approaching of the ions, this will turn out into a positive contribution of energy because there is this uh, repulsion that is being generated, which is way bigger than the, the Coulomb interaction that we had here. So such a force is usually implemented with a radio frequency pulse. I'm not going to get into the details of how you can uh, drive it or anything because it is very complex, but the thing is that uh, that's what, how they do it. And so, Ah, ah, yeah, I'm going to <laughs> because this is very interesting because this force is acting on the ions coherently. So what this means is that if you have uh, like an electron in a superposition of the up and down states, you apply a force and now the ion will be like moving in a superposition of one way and the other. So like the system will be in a superposition of moving like this and like this. I just wanted to say this. Um, <laughs> so we already know how to simulate the spin spin interaction. And now the only thing that is left is to actually perform the simulation. Uh, so what they did in the paper is, first they cancel out any spin spin interaction. They don't send any radio frequency pulse. They only apply the virtual magnetic field, which is done through a, another radio frequency pulse, okay? So they apply the magnetic field and they initialize the 
simulated six, uh, spins pointing in the same direction as the magnetic field. So what this means, this is a kind of paramagnetic uh, state because they are pointing in the direction of the magnetic field. Now, what they do is they start to activate the spin-spin interaction, okay, this J here, they start to activate it until a final state where the magnetic field is negligible uh, compared to the spin-spin interaction. And the final state like the, that they reach is the uh, entangled state of up-up and down-down. This is very weird because uh, there is no symmetry breaking here as there is in the icing model. In the icing model, you go from the uh, zero magnetiza magnetiza magnetization and the system somehow has to decide whether to go to up, up, and down, down. But here, what we have is a superposition of up, up, and down, down. And this is symmetric. So basically, they carry these simulations and they verify that this is the case. Uh, the, in the initial state, the probability of measuring up, up, or down, down is both, in both cases, 0 0.25, as it has to be. And in the final state, the probability of measuring up, up, or down, down is 0 0.5. And the, the simulation is successful. So, yeah. Um, as always, uh, a main issue is how to uh, scale the system. Like, you, you don't want to only simulate two spins, you want to simulate 30 or a million or whatever. Uh, and this also happens with quantum computation. But the thing is how to uh, increase quantity over quality. Like you have to maintain also the, the levels of the coherence. You have to, um, well, this kind of stuff, right? So uh, in a recent paper, well, 2000, in 2016, they did a simulation of up to 30 spins, not only in a one-dimensional array, but also in a two-dimensional mesh, and, in a, and also in a ring-shaped uh, structure. So that's very nice. Uh, also, so as you see, there are many efforts in pushing this technology. There are two main reasons. One of them is that quantum computation that, uh, like, Obtaining a universal quantum computer that could simulate any system is still far away. So in the meantime, what we can do is build these specific purpose uh, systems that can simulate a specific uh, system of study and simply study, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so before having any universal quantum computer. And also, it is, uh, the other reason is that spin Hamiltonians are very important for studying uh, quantum phase transitions. They are related to ferro uh, magnetism, to antiferromagnetism, to spin waves, and also they are believed to be, well, frustrated spins, they are believed to be responsible for high temperature superconductivity. And so, yeah, this is it. I simply wanted to give you a basic introduction of quantum simulations, and I hope that now if you want to search something on the web, you have some initial concepts in your mind. So thank you for, for your attention.